Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm doing a special talk here with a personal old friend of mine that I admire greatly and has had a, had a very profound effect and influence on my work personally. And and who has he not influenced over the years? I think uh, if anybody is like over 30, they would know. <laughs> who this man is uh, even like nowadays like even younger people will know who he is because of his recent collaborations with uh fashion brands off-white you name it uh i guess there's no other introduction except to say this is the man himself lenny mcgurr leonard mcgurr aka futura 2000 <laughs> thank you thank you bro and uh thank you Bali for having me back for Tate Ahead. Uh, all you guys, thank you so much. Uh, been a few years I've been with you previously, my first time here, and we talked about a project that's going to come to light tonight. So I'm so excited. And uh, yeah, as Rostar mentioned, uh, I think. Uh, Late night. When were you on Hope Street in Brooklyn? Like ninety five ish. Nineteen ninety five. Yeah. 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 Okay. Exactly. So I had a studio down the block, which I thought I was being like really like a uh, like a uh, how do you That's say? That's like older than Supreme. That's like yeah. a quarter century. Right. So I thought I was being like you yeah, young like guys, really like, like ahead old. of the curve by moving to Williamsburg. But, but no, you were on Hope Street. And so <laughs> I I had a studio in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, uh, on Hope Street, which was always. Very positive location, right? Duh, the name. You were very optimistic. This is before Obama. And I was like, I'm hoping this shit's going to work for me. It was actually uh, the late 80s when I got on Hope. Um, I was the benefactor of a lovely lady named Agnes B., right? Yes. Who doesn't love Agnes? That's right. Very so Agnes support. was uh, not just a, a patron and a friend to me at that time, but offered me the unbelievable possibility that I guess is an artist's dream, which was, uh, use the French term, an atelier. So I got a studio, and it was on Hope Street in Brooklyn, and on Yes... Was that because of Agnes? Yeah, I mean, her, um, she was buying work uh, through the, you know, not trying to backdoor me, like other individuals would always try to save money or circumvent the gallery system, whatever it may be. It could be totally low end, but still, people do that. Um, she didn't. She was so straight up, and she made a deal with me, which was studio space at the time. That space when I got there, row was five hundred a month. So that's six k annual. Right. Very doable. Very cheap for old school Brooklyn. This is like nineteen eighty eight. Right. And I was, I was paying a, a eighteen hundred for four thousand square feet. Okay. Well, I had a deal. Is, that was later. Yeah. Uh, we had a deal. That building was dope. It was like some real. Uh, educated artists, right, from like proper schools that knew about like artists in residence and they got a great deal in this space. Long story short, Agnes made me this deal. She said, at the end of the year, I'll come back, Lenny, and you offer me first right of refusal to buy work to compensate her for her $6,000 investment. So right. I was blown away because nobody acted like that. This is now the late 80s. Uh, damn, Sean may have been, Sean and, and Keith are about to pass. So, as it was anyway, the movement was on a downturn, and here was this woman coming from France and kind of being like my Joan of Arc, you know, like she just came to my rescue. And right, right. so, uh, and and I I've loved her ever since, and she's still supporting and you know being on yes. Right, exactly. She's a great supporter of mine, and obviously, I'm so thankful for her. I think a lot yeah. of artists from our school and community are grateful that she's there because mm. she just is always supporting artists and it's uh, it's a rarity in our in our story that people are sincere and they have the right um you know they under the, like a good heart right definitely definitely um was she one of the first people to bring you out to france yeah i mean i have been through france in the early 80s but by this time like i say our movement was already like passe and people weren't feeling graffiti art if you will anymore and i will say this is not yet even the advent of what street art 
became known to be. This is before you guys started barnstorming and right. right yeah. So there wasn't yet even an answer to what was the graffiti movement of the seventies and eighties in New York. That would actually, in my opinion, occur in the new millennium. Like when you have everyone kind of arriving or you know, I mean they're they're either on their way or they have arrived. And I credit higher names in our story, you know, like the hmm you know, like a Banksy, even, for example. I think he did a lot to elevate um, the story of what graffiti, the graffiti movement represents. Right. You know, it's a twisted Brit angle that's great because we don't think that way. Whether he's the uh, pioneer of stencils, well, that's a story you can have with Blake Lorette. You know, there's a lot of arguments over of the course, originality yeah. of everything. But respect, respect, because... Even the astronomical numbers that you see and hear, well, I'm not jealous. I'm not offended. I'm simply living my own life in my own time, right? And I'm going to find, I mean, you know, if the ceiling is like way the fuck up there, well, there's a lot of room between the floor and the ceiling to find comfort, right? Of course. So it's not about aspirational, oh, I got to be like dude or look at someone like Brian Cause today who I'm in like admiration of because of his kind of ability to surf that kind of territory where you're like, damn, is that your property? No, it isn't, but they're giving you permission to do, you know, it's kind of genius in a way. It's I like mean, way, way, sorry, way beyond did, what Andy was trying to do. Right, and so I, I know that you guys, uh, you and Stash had brought Brian to Tokyo or had introduced him to Nigo. Yeah, I mean, you know, Brian is the second wave, right, of, of the arrival of all these American artists in, in Japan at that time. The, yeah, the Harajuku moment. Like, but this is even leading up to the millennium. This is like, like 98, 99 now. We hit like 96. So even the two-year advantage Stash and I had on everybody sort of figuring it out. Or it wasn't so much that everyone figured it out. Everyone realized from New York at least, you know, we got to go to Tokyo. Because truth is, Tokyo did a lot for me in the mid-90s, late 90s, and not just with the Nigo Association and Harajuku and Joni Otak, you know, to cut, like all these great people, the clothing or, you know, the clothiers, the W-taps, the Takshins, like everyone. Right. It, uh, it was a big movement. Nobu, hysteric. Happened. It was yeah. so much shit happening there. And for us, we were foreigners. Obviously, duh. We're Gajin, right? We're running around. We like can't speak to you. Can't even say like, hello. So it was a learning curve, but a great one as an artist and slash graphic artist even because someone like Escape Thing, who's the kind of um whatever the, the one of the greatest he's a genius graphic yeah, designers exactly. of our generation right. we all admire him so much but watching someone work whether it's watching an artist paint he or she do what they do visually like you see them you see their hands you see how they move when they do what they do it's really fascinating and watching this guy in like 96 chain smoking with a really oh man i mean i smoke cigarettes i cannot stand a a dirty ashtray. This dude does like ashes, cigarettes all over the table. All over his computer. <laughs> but he was like, <laughs> key commands and shit. Shit I didn't even, like levels I didn't even know about yet. And I was writing code and That's being right. online, right, in 96 and stuff. So I was already like into computing, but not on some Japanese level. Like right. He's definitely way, way nerdy yeah. and like out there. But Amazing. Yes, you had a web, was it uh, future2000.com? It eventually was, but I would like to say that, you know, I've been known, uh, I'm sorry, I'm known for being, oh, he's the abstract guy, he's a this, he's a that. And yes, I did do certain things through my timeline, but I was really super proud of my website in 96 yeah. because, yeah. you know, we're all going to be on IG later today and shit, but people like Sammy, and splay that we had up and running and my own concept of what the internet if you will was going to be which is ultimately a sharing device where we can uh we can do our propaganda for the branding whatever you know your your whole spiel is but the idea that any individual could do what i was doing which is simply writing html and submitting imagery and gifs and fucking sound effects and 
it was it was so simple yet no one had really done it right, right. and so you were we, ahead of the the curve well I mean, it was like it writing was very early on in the it was my time. graffiti moment if you will right because it's nothing more than and you know that's why i hated facebook from the beginning it's like oh tag our wall <laughs> what are you kidding me like come on you're so unoriginal so the concept you know, or even please like me on Facebook. How fucking shallow is your life that you need to ask people to like you? It's like, right. the whole concept fucked me up. So I was like, okay, this is, is how you can do it. This isn't, I'm not a designer. I don't know shit about what I'm doing. I was simply, you know, copy and pasting, right? It's like, oh, my man said, look at someone's website, copy the source, change the color, you know, matrix or helix, whatever that shit was, like six digit, whatever, letter, alphanumeric shit, and put imagery and write text and tell stories. I used to interview myself and make it sound like it was some real posh academic person asking me stupid questions, right? So, they, they so just a backstory on his website. So it was like, what was it, like 96? Yeah, it was 96. And, and it was like a maze. You would go yeah, in it was and a then labyrinth. you would press a button or maybe you have to press a few buttons. You can and experience then it tonight on yeah. a site called The Wayback Machine. It, it's, it's, it actually still lives there. Okay. I mean, it's it's corny now because, you know, it's quite quite late. No, in the but game. if you think about that, but it, era, but it was really cool. It was like at the time. you would be sucked in for hours just and it'll kids take you were from one place the, to another. The modem, it. you know, you guys all remember modems and dial ups and all. And, and it's that era really, the, you know, the dawn of it all. And uh, in the early 90s, after a failed clothing company effort I did with some friends, uh, I was like, damn, man, I got to. I had to learn all this computing shit, but computers were so expensive. So I took a job at Kinko's, uh, right there in university What place. year was that? That's like 94. So oh, Kinko's wow. was offering uh, users, uh, you know, fucking uh, patrons. Hey, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, people that come in to buy your shit, whatever. Uh, what do you call it? Customers, customers right. thank you. Yeah. And, and color yeah, copies. I hate that word. Color copies were like twenty dollars. Twenty dollars for like one um, eight by ten or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right? but you know the idea that they were renting computing time for people. They call it like desktop publishing, right? That was our big pitch. Like, hey, come on, use our computer. You can use Microsoft Word. You know all this kind of stuff. And that's when I got turned on to Apple and Adobe and all this shit. And I was like, hmm, this is really interesting. And so I worked color copies at night at Kinko's, and because I. It's like used to work midnight shifts graveyard I, I love that shift and so I was working graveyard at Kinko's had a ton of copying to do but I'm a go-getter so I do the whole shit in like 10 minutes and then I got like nine hours and 50 you know whatever like the whole time off and I would just practice on computing I learned about Photoshop although I was more drawn to Illustrator and I still am more of like a AI guy than a JPEG guy but just to say, I got it. I really wrapped up in computing, and people were talking about the internet coming online in the next year. And I was like, "Oh shit, what's that?" And but the thing about my site at the time that I think I appreciated and was took, you know, uh, was a bene you know, I, I benefited from was that most of the people who had computing at that time weren't kids at home like you know today, but were students in schools. So most of the URLs and 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 uh, you know whatever the numbers of the kids that were you know their IP addresses or whatever were all EDUs, a lot of EDUs. And I was really, I was like, yeah, that's really cool. Like kids in school are, are getting access to this because basically they're the ones who have the tech in their hands at the time. So as a result, you know, occasionally I run into people that are like, oh shit, Lenny, your, your website, man, that really made me think about the, you know, online. Because I was really advocating people doing what I was doing. What I was doing only took time. It was tedious. You know, I had to do a lot of, you know, computing, if yeah, you will. But, but you love tinkering. I do. Yes. I do. Yes. Yeah. You're like the, 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 the supreme knoller and tinkerer, I think. Well, I get, um, you know, it's funny, like we're up here and you guys are talking to me and, you know, we're, we're both creative people and I'm celebrated for being future and I totally appreciate it. I mean, it's a great job, but I don't live as you know my life like when i leave you guys tonight or whenever i'm not going to just run around and always you know i'm not always futura okay and so i think right. part of the thing i enjoy really is the i don't want to make a joke about all the deep shit we're doing here but the duality right the the kind of bruce wayne batman effect i i'm, I'm able to have because quite frankly i prefer being lenny mcgurr right i prefer just being me without 
you judging me because, oh, shit, that's Futura. Right. So if I had an opportunity to more be me in my life, I, I want to do that. So I have to get off the grid and not do Futura shit, you know. So case in point, I, I did a wonderful trip 10 years ago, uh, which I thought was a real great adventure in not being me, which was I went around all these baseball stadiums in, in America because I, I like baseball. And it was kind of a lifelong dream. I don't know if you know I did that, Ro. Yeah, that's right. You yeah. did, right. Mm -hmm. So I did this major thing over two years where I went to all these stadiums. But the joy of that experience not just was the completion and accomplishment of doing that, that whole ambitious task, but not under the guise of me being me. You know, it was just me being Lenny. And, and you love baseball. Lenny the baseball guy. And yeah. I think two times in 32 stadiums, somebody came up and was like, yo, oh shit, Futura. You know, it was like in Houston, Texas and uh, fucking Oakland, California. You know, so seemingly places, yeah, you, you might know me. Um, cool Spanish kid, by the way, in Houston. We were actually still in touch. He sent me a photo that he took then, you know, like a quick, hey, can I get a selfie? It was, people call it selfies back there. Hey, can I get a selfie? And then... Uh, he sent me one or whatever like uh, some years later or no I met him as something and after that event he sent me the photo he sent me like the two photos it's, you know pretty cool and so that's Le the thing like Le Lenny happens to be one of the most humble and giving people and and it's like when people go up to him you know they are starstruck but I mean he's always so eloquent and has been very giving with his time and knowledge. And, it would be yeah. it would so be unconscionable very, for to me you, to man, be honestly. like that other guy, you know, that I see a lot in other people, right? You know, who carry themselves a certain way, and I'm like, wow. First of all, the fact is, I'm so grateful that my life, um, you know, that, that everything's turned out great. I have my health, obviously. You know, I'm I'm getting older. Uh, I can't avoid that, but. I'm feeling younger, not just by the energy I feel like I, I still have, but you're right, I'm getting a lot of response from a younger audience right now, which is encouraging, because I think um, whether it's someone, as you mentioned, rest in peace, Virgil Abloh, you know, we can all deeply um, understand the loss. Um, mm. But just to say someone like he, uh, or, or, or people like that, who are already super successful in doing what they do and don't really gotta fuck with me at all, yet pay the respect to me to fuck with me, and yet in doing so introduce me to a new community and who I see a lot now, young bucks, whatever, young lady, whoever, women, them, they, whoever, all of you, being really like aware and like, wow, Futura, you know, like, and it's kind of like people who younger people obviously who maybe didn't know you know my body of work or but are rediscovering or if they thought oh maybe you know maybe you were like doing something different and now you're doing this but you you tend to i think i i kind of always say this about you like you're having like your third or fourth wave because thank you you've just been he's been around for so long and at the very beginning of not just graffiti but when graffiti turned into the art gallery scene and like with like um you know you showed with like uh was that um Stefan Eines like at the uh, fashion, fashion Moda. Moda. that was 19, that's, uh 42 years ago 1980 which yeah. oh by the way I'm not the recipient of this information although kind of it's a rubs off on me in a good way but a painting from that exhibition there's an exhibition in a very alternative space in the South Bronx in 1980. 147th Street? Uh, and 3rd Avenue. Right. And it was run by a guy, Austrian guy named Stefan Eintz and another gentleman from the city, Joe Lewis. They were kind of curating and, and doing shows, but Gas, Graffiti Art, Art Success. Success. Yes, right. Curated by Crash, Johnny Crash Matos. And it was the lineup of the time, myself, Lee Quinones, Crash Days. Ramelzi? Uh, Ramelzi, no, not yet. Okay. Uh, maybe not even Dondi. Lady Pink was in that show. John Fechner. A great list of artists. All of the graffiti work, if you will, was done on plywood. You know, a four foot by eight foot sheet of plywood. Uh, recently, Christie's, within a month, uh, that shit sold for 250000 USD. Mm. Now, that's fucking crazy. But, thank you, because 
at least the value of my work has been established on a historical level. I'm not making loot like that for current work, and that's ironic. Uh, but, but then again, yes, I mean, I, I get it. I'm not vintage yet, <laughs> but I ain't going to be around that long. So, you know, I, I bet on the future. This is the future's bet right here. Yeah. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> but no, just to say that those kind of things are wonderful. And, you know, whatever the deal was 42 years ago, I could care less, right? Because, you know, I've said many times, it's like, I'm fortunate that, you know, I, I, I'm doing well as an artist and there's a, there's a kind of a number there. I choose not to say it or I don't even want to look at it. But that number is there. But at the same time, like, I'd rather do a fresco for you than a painting. You know, that's that whole French dispatch shit, which is always genius. It's like, no, it's a fresco. So the idea that, you know, if you're in New York City anytime soon, I've done a fresco at the Supreme store, back to Supreme. And the whole great thing about that is, like I said to James, the owner, and he knows me for 25 years, predates Supreme. Since uh, Union days. Since Union days, early 90s. Or when he was actually yeah. uh, selling t-shirts at the parking lot of uh, Tower Records. Whatever the case may you be. Know. Yeah. yeah. That's you know, uh, early humble beginnings. <laughs> very humble. <laughs> yeah. And look at those numbers now. Jesus. But he was selling your t-shirts back, he in, was. And back he in the was, 90s. Like that's in right. The early, late 80s, 90s. I but think, cut to open. five, six years ago when they relocated in New York, he said, hey, Fuge, you know, Future is like a Brit way. They've always called me Fuge. Hey, Fuge, we would love to get a new painting or something. And I was like, yeah, are you, are you into me actually just painting right up on the wall? He's like, yeah, that's fucking brilliant. So right there, it's like in an Anya B class, right, of where you're not trying to leverage proper, you know, like ownership of a thing. Mm -hmm. You're willing to have me do what I do on the wall. And you know what? No one really owns it. And at the end of the day, whitewash the shit and let's keep moving. And that's really the spirit of my origin. I mean, you know, why, how could I now, because I have the ability, leverage all that shit for economic value? Like, yeah, that's the, uh, the obvious, but it's not the motivation. You know what I mean? I, I don't get comfort in that. You know, it's, it actually gives, it makes me uncomfortable. You know, friends of mine want to buy the work. It's like, God damn. Why? Why do you want to buy the work? Why do you want to buy the work? You know, I'm going to work it out, though. I, God forbid. I mean, you know, the world is so fucking serendipitous and wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm on my way here. I'm in Doha I'm on, on a connecting flight from New York. My wife is there. Sky's there. We're, we're, we're hanging out. I got my back. You know, they see what's going on. I don't even see what's going on. Somebody behind, someone comes behind me in a fucking Doha lounge and puts their hands over my eyes like, Hey, what's going on? Cool, cool to see you here. Like some, you know, the normal shit where you sneak up on your boy. I have no fucking idea who it is. I'm like, okay, keep talking. I kind of hear a Brit accent. I'm trying to grab the hands. He turns around. It's fucking Goldie. Yeah. Okay, I haven't <laughs> seen Goldie. He's he remembered. He's like, no, 2000, just 20 years, bro. I was in Brooklyn, right? So I'm like, damn you. And then we go off and we have a cigarette. And then he says to me, come on, man, I got to get, you know, I love you, bro. And I'm a, I'm a big fan. I got to get some work. I'm like, God damn it, Goldie. <laughs> Fuck, you got to get some work. I said, okay, we'll work out a charitable thing, right? Because I think that's the way I have to approach it now where it's like, I don't want to take money from my friends. That's, uh, it's always hard. Yeah, yeah. I want to share. Or, or in the case, you know, in the worst case scenario, and it's not worst case scenario, let's say best case scenario, Let's swap a painting. How about that? Right? Then that way, even if you're getting value added, that's not the issue. It's two of us. We're boys. You know, we're, we're homies. And let's just share our work. And, you know, you're going to wind up giving it to the kids anyway, right? So, you know, it's all in good hands in that sense. So uh, I think amongst artists or amongst thieves, whatever, you know, it, it's, it's better to do it that way. Because I do not like taking money from my friends you know it's just i mean you know, it obviously feels a little weird it's like selling a painting to your family member it's like i don't think that's gonna yeah happen well it's <laughs> like it's it's like the kids said when you you know looking for girls it's like uh you know there's a lot of fish in the sea right so i would always think that well i don't need to take money from you know people i love because it makes me feel bad you know i mean push comes to shove, I'll just give you this shit, please. You know, and then don't make it uncomfortable. You know, this is always levels, right? But I would rather, you know, I mean, God, um, 
take out a wall or you want me to, you know, like that's kind of the approach too, I think, to public art that I don't want to lose focus of. Okay, I know we're having this wonderful conversation, but I'm really here for this other thing. Yes. So, of do, course... Do we want to talk so about it? So, we can it? talk about the sculpture a little bit. Okay. So, okay. No, no, but let's, this is, let's this is stay how on it topic. should be. This is how it should be, and I don't think it should be as rigid, and I'm not no, going to no, go no. on we're, this script We're here. just I having a conversation. We were relating the last time, I mean, we were talking about some whack-ass gallery we were associated with in... Uh, in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Abu Dhabi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right, right. <laughs> But uh, war, war stories, but we're not going to no, talk no, actually, about war no, stories. No, 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 it, yeah, yeah. Was it Abu Dhabi? No, it was no, Dubai. Uh, Dubai. Dubai. It was Dubai. My bad. My right, bad. Right. Yeah, it was. It was all this uh, Middle East stuff going on. But uh, yes. Yeah, and anyway. I'm sure you've been through many war stories over the years, but we're not going to talk about no, we're not. that no, we're because not. that's not worth our, our time. Um, but the thing is, like, I heard about Lenny was going to make a sculpture out here like uh, three years ago before I moved out here, and uh, I was like, wow, that's going to be so dope. I'm like. So in my mind, I was already like, what is he going to make? Because I heard that he was going to make it out of recycled plastic or maybe garbage or, you know, recycled trash, something. I wasn't sure. So in my mind, I was brewing up these ideas of what he was going to possibly do, uh, you know, for three years since uh, COVID happened after that. So um, and then I got to see that it was made. So how do you feel about the sculpture? Are you are you happy with the way it turned out? Uh, is it what you would imagined in the beginning or obviously it transformed into this you know it's its own thing and uh it's way beyond even uh the scale obviously i mean this is the biggest piece i've ever been associated with and it's weird because i really got to shout out uh some guy watch yes. and all the individuals responsible Mike Rusick. i know yes. a lot of people touch this shit and will continue to do so over the course of its life here at that's a um, ballot, you know, potato head. But just to say, my figure uh, that I'm most known for uh, in 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 that kind of world, the Point Man, uh, came to life when when we came out here back in '19 and saw what was going on here in the effort that they're making locally with sustainability and upcycle and recycle mm -hmm. and make use of waste and. All of what I saw, whether it was the flip flop, the mound of flip flops, or you know, this, all of the, the recycled cabinetry, all or of it, whatever all it of it. You know, it, it, and and not to say like that didn't ring any bells. I mean, I was laughing when I was a kid in the '60s. Uh, ecology was like a big thing, right? Where you have hippies coming out of that movement talking about sustainable this and solar that, and you know, people were like, "You're bugging," and so just to say, it, it's not new. Right. But it's wonderful to see people really proactively trying to deal with, you know, however small. And, you know, we're doing our part back home as best we can. I mean, you know, we're not Japanese. We don't have six boxes of shit. But we have a few different boxes that we put waste in. And we're right. conscious. It's gotten right? better over the years. No, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. just saying, like, those guys, you know, everybody goes to a level. I am I could go to that level, but I'm not comfortable there, right? So let me... <laughs> <laughs> Let me be at the level that I'm comfortable with, and I can actually help you, right? I can make my contribution. And then hopefully what I do might inspire somebody else. You know, it happened in another field. Maybe it'll happen there. So my thing is we had to do something like that, you know, and we were... I mean, we're, we're, we're fortunate that simultaneous to what's going to happen here tonight in the reveal of this guy, we have another piece that they all, you know, the artisans, let's just call them that, uh, they fabricated another great piece that's in the design center in Singapore. In Singapore, which is amazing. And that's made out of like 14,300 plastic bags. Plastic bags. Yeah, yeah. And there's a whole black, white, dazzle dizzle dazzle effect going on with that it's almost a like camo like and referential actually to, we spoke about it earlier the dazzle camouflage of world war one which was used in uh the nautical you know game uh battleships Camo yeah camouflage camouflage it's kind of like a zebra on the on the on the you know savannah yes. ship because believe it or not that's some natural shit that helps them Hide. Survive, yeah. Although they're sticking out. I mean, I've, I've been on a couple of those missions in Africa and I've seen them and I was like so bored seeing zebras. I was like, another zebra. It's like they're all over the place. But <laughs> as are the wildebeest, you know, look for, uh, look for some of the exotic ones. It's hard. But, uh, and you got like lions and shit hanging out 
My name is Leonard, by the way. I love lions. Um, <laughs> but just to say, yeah, you know, it's so fantastic, man, to see this thing. And, and, and the process, you know, when we were here before, Bali, uh, I'm sorry, Potato Head here is already known for, you know, these fabrication. You know, they had a design show back then where they're making the furniture and That's right. the processes of like heat press, mushy, you know, it's like a mushy, mushy game with all the, the elements and stuff. It's really crazy, you know, and like, I can see where it's fascinating to really turn all this waste into something cool, whether it's a table or, you know, I don't know if that's a 12 meters, it's like a 10 meter-ish statue out there. I think it's yeah, you know. six, six meter, yeah, something like that. Okay, right? I'll take six meters. Yeah. And um, <laughs> that's still 18 feet still in my huge, country. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, pretty yeah, damn yes. big. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so stupid. I am so stupid, guys. You don't know. But you're getting actually, you know, I prefer this because like, you're getting a little more of the real me, which I, that's what I was trying to, you know, it's like, hey, I'm real. Yo, I'm real, yo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he is the real thing. Um, um, so can I ask you about the, the point man? Obviously, yeah. the point man has been your character for yes. quite a long time and has evolved over the years. Yep. So uh, when did the point man become the point man kind of that it is now? Is it Was that in the 90s or the well, 80s? Well, you know, I will credit uh the whole Moax uncle moment in the mid 90s right around the same time i invaded japan you know 94 right, right. 95 right. finally met james in 92 right. so, so that relationship met, was you up met and him running. in 92 did yep. you meet nigo at the same time no, or I was met, that a separate i met nigo time? in, in 95 uh nigo Four, says 95 okay. yeah okay. i think i met nigo in son 95 right, but i had right. met james and it's actually on a trip to japan with james and that whole kind of musical uh troop where I got a chance to meet Skate Thing. The funny thing was, I met Skate Thing. Uh, the Mowax tour was touring Japan, Osaka, um, Fukuoka, Sapporo, whatever, like mm -hmm. cities around Japan. I got left behind, right? So, major oversight. <laughs> I got left behind because, you know, there wasn't budget for me. Mm. This is 95. Right. So, I'm hanging out walking Tokyo from Shinjuku to Shibuya and then Shibuya to Harajuku. I was like doing what a New Yorker does. They walk. And I was checking and everything I was, every corner, every, every, every food mart, every mushy, mushy Genki, everything was fucking new. And I was just like, Oh my God. This, oh shit. Oh shit. And I was just loving it. And all of a sudden I see skate thing who was like, Hey, hello, hello. And I, I didn't know a skate thing, but skate thing. And he's wearing a GFS hat. That's my failed company from the early 90s. Not really. I mean, we we made a little moment. Gerb, but which means Gerb, Gerb Pichura, Pichura and Stash. Stash GFS. Right. And that's, that's where Philly's Blunt t-shirt, that, that was the sadly. one. So that was one of the first like kind of logo bite t-shirts. Big time. That, that really sparked off this kind of logo biting like graphics scene in not only Tokyo but around the world and I think that was like a, I mean it was a what, forerunner was that? was that like 92? that was 92 yeah exactly right but the GFS logo was uh, the graphic balls from our subway system the the round the colored G -train, the G -train, train the F train, train the S train yeah. and so coming from graffiti school we were using that symbolism to quasi represent our history pretty pretty classic and, and actually looking back a little bit corny but hey we're looking for identity and we could claim it at least right we're not like appropriating some shit that wasn't right. ours so we it wasn't just fully... like stealing the krylon logo it exactly was like, yes it was about so your life we did that but cut to 95 uh harajuku here's this guy waving at me skate thing with a gfs hat but like re re fucked with like he did something to it and it was like fluffy shit coming out of the top and it was him touching stuff, right? Where like whatever the item was, it was dope, but it could be doper. Mm. And let me fuck with it. Another thing about skate thing, when I met him, he had a sewing machine. You know, here's his computer and there's his sewing machine. And he's making a ghillie suit. I don't know if you know what a ghillie suit is, but it's what snipers wear in the military. That crazy ass fucking suit with all the... You can just fall into the grass and you don't oh, see... It's just, and, yeah, but like... Right. To make one, I mean, come on, really? And, you know, like, <laughs> so that's what I'm saying about the levels. And, like, right there, that whole photograph in my mind of what I saw, I assimilate, you know, I, I, I facsimile that shit. I went back to New York, and that's when we started Project Dragon. Right, right. And I had my bunker 
That's on right. 27th it was like, it was Street. Like an army bunker, basically. Yeah, it was yeah. crazy. I had camouflage had material like that I just wrapped, the I, I, like wallpapered my yeah. room in camouflage. And then I painted everything green. I had all my Max painted green. It was really a great office. Yeah. And uh, so I was fully kind of copying them because I was like, man, I can't take it to skate things level, but all of us are so far behind. If I just excel, you know, if like I just step on the gas like a little bit, I'll leave everybody behind, right? And that's ultimately I felt in the in the coming out of the '90s into the new millennium. And sadly, oh God, there's Futura 2000. It's like 1999. Shout out to Prince. And I was just like, how boring and corny am I that I lived to see this number arrive? Because in 1970, when I was 15, well. 2000 was 30 years away. I was going to be, what, 45? And I was. But I'm not going to live. You know, when I'm 15, I'm not ever going to live to be 45, yeah, You right? don't think about that. The so that far, yeah. as 2000 approached, I was like, oops, okay, I kind of predated my shit. And I, you know, Andre, <laughs> he was already there, so I guess I couldn't be 3000. But just to say, <laughs> ah, you, got, you guys got that, right? <laughs> um, I said that before, no one laughed. Um, the, Thank you. <laughs> um, no, just to say that, um, yeah, it, it was crazy arriving in the new millennium. You know, Y2K. Remember Y2K? They were yes. they were afraid that like all the computers were going to reset and shit. And it was, wow, what a scam, right? Um, <laughs> but just to say, yeah, surviving all that, and then you know, then that's when I like, oh, I'm not Futura 2000. <laughs> you, of course, you're not. You're dead. I was like, I'm Futura, and then that was comfortable. You know, even though. I stole that from the typeface, the uh, car, the blender, right. the sewing machine. You know, nothing original about the name Futura. But the, the, the alpha numeric, if you will, the combination of the year 2000, which was a projection in my mind, but which is also a direct bite of 2001 A Space Odyssey, right. which in 1968, when I was, what, uh, 13, that movie kind of blew my mind, you know, because I was like, damn, you know, like we're already circling the earth and go, trying to go to the moon and we would a year later. But that whole era of being a 13, 14, 15 year old, you got to you got to admit, man, wow, what a cool time to be that age. And, and not for nothing, it was. And here's the end result. Some weird ass 67 year old. But right. But your love for science fiction and like oh, it never ends. And, and, and it and predates that, yeah. it predates Arthur C. Clarke and it predates Kubrick. Because I'm come from that post-war atomic threat. Oh, look what happens when the when the bugs get it. You know, they suck the radiation and shit, and they become giant creatures. Right. The whole Godzilla story, exactly. right? Ultraman, it's 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 born yeah. out of that, mm -hmm. right? It's born out of this nuclear thing or something triggered. Blah blah blah. So just to say, yeah, I've been a fantasy of all of those sort of influences, and I try to. Because I came up with a cool name, unbeknownst to me, I outdated myself, yet I tried to stay current. You know, like even in the year 2000, my, my website's still up and running. People are just kind of getting turned on to it. And by now, more people are having access to computing. Um, you know, that computer, um, what did I have? It was like a Mac, uh, they called it the bronze. It was a beautiful black Mac uh, PowerBook you know first gen of those and and like i wrote all my shit on that i i wrote everything in notepad basically i used to love notepad and and now i, I what is the apple app like notes right right yeah. i live in that shit yeah yeah because you get an idea and you know i mean we don't carry pen and paper anymore so you got notes like oh my god man. copy that shit so just when you're on some flow shit or you just think you come up with something cool you know jot it down just uh or or be cool and carry a book and, and and like a pen and write shit. That's even cooler. So your work has always been like, even though you come from the graffiti world or during that seminal era, you know, in the, in the seventies and eighties, your work was always different. It was about like abstraction, uh, not fractals, but like, you know, like nucleuses and, 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 you sure. know, I really always loved that about your work, that it wasn't just about you writing your name. It was about, feeling it was like more like looking at jazz or something visually you know so i we really always re appreciated your work and it was a standout among all other like kind of like uh your you know your friends that were doing graffiti at the time yeah some of the different some of the giants you know the the lee quinones the dandies the the zeffs the the scenes the 
you know, the quicks, the crashes, the dazes. And, you know, there were so many artists on trains in the 70s, obviously, that laid all that groundwork visually. But but I must say, I think that the, the benefit of all of our, our culture is really comes down to the documentation of it, right? Like mm, the Martha Coopers Martha Cooper. and the Henry, Henry Chalfonts of the yeah. world. Because without their love and devotion to our, you know, community and and really they befriended all of us you know and and i think it's a remarkable kind of exchange amongst you know the creatives and the people who are there to kind of capture the history of it all because yes i'm widely known for some abstract car i painted 42 years ago the break right train. right before graffiti art success right the gas show we mentioned with crash mm. in fashion moda just before i painted that piece of plywood that sold for a quarter mil I went and painted the brake train, which is this abstract car, uh, full subway wagon, if you will, which was the gold standard for artists of that moment who really were trying to do something, whether it's Lee's whole car masterpieces, Fat Five Freddy's uh, soup cans, um, scenes. scenes, just uh, abstractions of, of like popular characters we know in cartoons, Knox, otherworldly kind of style wars car of 1980 just great art on trains free as fuck didn't cost the public a dime i mean yeah maybe they were inconvenienced by you know paint on the window oops i'm sorry but it's like what we were able to do for nothing right now i want to have a talk with management like how do we speak to the mass transit authority which is the subway system of new york city and how do i pay for a commercial wrap of one of those cars because they're selling that shit there's a price to that and rather than selling a whack-ass product or some commodity we none of us need pay for my own advertising to do an abstract painting that runs around the city of new york because that's really the thing about graffiti on trains in its moment it wasn't about well yeah it was about yo look at my shit that's me but it was also about imagine the concept of art moving around a major city in the world 24 7 you know the shit doesn't close at midnight like some systems around the world these guys are running non-stop yeah truncated schedules over you know the weekends and late night i get it but the trains are still running so it's conceivable that you could have a train like the twos and fives of new york city that we loved as graffiti writers because they went through Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx. You know, you got like a long line of visibility. And it's a two-way street. They got to go down, and then they got to come back. And they do that shit every, you know, but every But it was hour. a big feat to do that, like a complete car. I mean, you were risking your life, getting thrown in jail, running. I think I did the brake train so in less than things. four hours. So it's, right. it's also wow. like if you can imagine painting under pressure. I mean, obviously, it's illegal. Uh, but... Just to say, I don't, you know, I, I, I wonder how could I pull that off. But, but, but back to Henry and Martha, and Martha specifically, because she took the photograph. So if Martha doesn't come that next morning and run the system, you know, knowing what train I painted, knowing where to be. So she knew ahead of time. Well, like, when we you told her we were going out to paint. Because wow. Dondi would always tell her, hey, I got a train running. It's done in such and such a yard. It's painted on the east or west side of the train, you know, whatever side you determine. But it doesn't really matter because where she would post up in the Bronx or wherever to catch it elevated, you know, as it comes out from below ground. And now you got that wonderful shot. I Back to the Serengeti or the Savannah, like, that's just like a fucking jaguar in nature running through the jungle, right? Right, right. So for her to capture it on film is a spectacular feat. And, of course... I profit in a way psychologically because people see that and they're like, oh shit, he did that. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's no photograph, it's the proverbial fucking tree in a forest kind of thing, right? Right, gets tagged up well, or no, whatever. Or, or just you like, know. what brick train? What abstract? You right. see what I'm saying? True. It never happened. Right. So how grateful am I that we had such a connection with these documentarians who yeah. till this day, I mean, Martha Cooper's in her 70s, 10 years Ah, 75 Henry is in his young 80s and Martha was just in the DRC okay that's not like some street in New York that's like Democratic Republic of Congo she's hanging out with artists there painting 
So that's really, you know, admirable. Definitely, I think, definitely. you know, and so much respect to and I, and I love her too. Like, yeah. you know, maybe more than I love Agnes. I'm sorry, Agnes, but <laughs> <laughs> just to say, I do love Martha uh, as well. And you know, it's great that you have these people who are able to help you tell your story. I mean, I guess, right. uh, like I said, if she didn't do it, you know, who would who would be crediting me? As such, and in the reboot twenty-five year edition of Subway Art, you know the big, the big boy, like not the little original, it's a double-page spread. So that's a kind of uh, historical publication. You know, uh, it's like in, it's like really in there. You yeah. know, and I'm documenting so is obviously very important, no mm. matter what you do. But especially if you do graffiti or street art, it's like it could be gone. <laughs> like the next morning or who knows or it rains and then you anticipate you anticipate it, it certainly could be gone you know or, or right. rather than even gone what about gone over you know that's exactly even, that's, or that's from not somebody so nice. hating yeah. on you i'm, I'm yeah. sure there was a lot of uh war between like you know or beefs between you and other writers or different crews right back um in the day. honestly maybe not with you honestly but, Ron, no not no. not really with me i mean you know like yeah. I'm, I'm not like uh you know gonna go over someone or, or whatever the case would be and right. it, it all starts with something like that but no i mean i think we we grew out of that you know fashion moda was uh i think back to that show that was the elevator you know uh we all felt somewhat elevated right from what we were doing to being above ground right. and that was an important transition although like i said i mean i think the 80s kind of crashed and burned for the graph so, so after that the the uh stefan they they put a show together was the Times square show yeah they that were was involved in the Times square show which was very important. that's actually before gas oh that? yeah okay. that's summer of 80 Okay. And I was only, uh, you know, uh, an observer. I wasn't physically in the Times Square show. It would okay. be the next year. Which was uh, in New PS1, York, New yeah. York New Wave. New York New yes, Wave, yes. PS1. 1981. And that was a breakout show. That's the show that Jean-Michel was kind of discovered. Right. If you will. Because that was a show curated by a guy named Diego Cortez. And rest in peace. And Diego had, oh man, over 120 different artists from what was now this emerging downtown artist community that Keith was very much part of, obviously, you know, Kenny, but many, many artists in that show. All right. Um, and so... Some you, not here today, uh, sadly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, you obviously were good friends with uh, with Keith, and you were also friends with, with uh, John michelle as well. I mean, I'm sure yes. it was a very small scene, even though there was a lot of interesting people back in the 80s, but... I mean, you know, you're obviously had done paintings. I don't know about doing paintings together, but you definitely like traveled in the same yeah, I crowds mean, you know, and clubs and what have you, right? We did, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, we were always very proud of Jean because, you know, he's like the first one of us to really rise up to and the top, yeah, begin yeah. to be collected and ultimately, mm. of course, to the top. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the breakout show was him and Andy, obviously. You know, that was the show that really you know kind of broke everything open for him as far as the possibility right um, i mean it wasn't well received by critics but i know it wasn't was at one the time. of my favorite shows or bodies of work between the two of them ever i know? mean i participated in the diaries that they that they produced as um uh, the warhol diaries um some kind of a doco i have a little small moment in that but like yeah i remember that that show wasn't well received and mm -hmm. There was a moment where Jean thought he was being exploited. You know, it was a, it was a weird moment. Yeah, being used by like yeah, uh, Andy. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. But at the same time, uh, doors were opening for potential sales of his work. You know, and different dealers who were gravitating around representing him. But I remember the kind of the beginnings. You know, Ro, remember those kind of studios down in Soho where like you could open up a couple of you know, kind of gates and go down into a basement right mm, below yeah, the right. street level. Right. And that like glass was... glass blocks you could see. Yeah, you could see the glass block yeah, windows yeah. or, yeah. you know, like I say, you just have these two gates, rectangular, you go down that stairway and there'd be like a little lower. they kind of like a... I don't know, it was... Below ground. Below like ground. And uh, yeah. they had they had Jean up in there at one point, I remember, just banging out drawings and work. And, you know, I remember thinking like, wow... You know, like, are they are they taking advantage of him, or is he taking advantage of him? You know, it's like, 
And then I had mentioned recently, you know, Jean was telling me early days, like, you know, uh, the gallery needs the artist. And the artists don't need the gallery. And then at one point I was like, well, that's easy for you, to, you know, because he was really well, he doing. Was already he was doing top. really well, right. and mm. you know, no one in his circle was doing, let's say, as well or anywhere close to as well, because also when the door opened up to the fine art, you know, uh, consumers or whatever they were really trying to sell, if you will, in Soho, we weren't part of that. You know what I mean? It was sort of like another tier. Of buyers, right, I see. you know, yeah. and at the time I was a little bitter, but also, you know, I was looking at my son who was just an infant and shit, and I'm like, well, I can't, you know, this whole thing is not sustainable back to our sculpture, but just to say that, um, so, yeah, it wasn't. Right, you know. and so, I mean, yeah, we won't talk about that too much longer, but so back then when uh, Keith Haring and Basquiat passed away, I heard like there was a lot of like backlash from like uh, the galleries were like, okay, graffiti is dead. Uh, you know, that's over with. And and, yeah. and you actually were like, didn't care about showing or you weren't interested in showing with galleries anymore. Well, like time? I said, yeah, I had cut myself off for a minute. I was actually a messenger. I mean, I remember when my son was a young kid. That was like my first real job. Uh, I mean, I had previously worked obviously, but you know, that was like when I'm, on the street working you know and i'm like was looking at like you know i'm talking about paying 500 bucks a month rent right at the studio that i'm that i'm not paying yet i don't have that studio yet but just to say that kind of a number on a rent i think mm -hmm. if i'm paying 500 rent for the studio maybe my house rent might have been a thousand right? right so now i'm actually paying 1500 a month rent right luckily on yes's investment is offsetting that expense but i still got to pay my rent so a thousand a month rent, I need a thousand dollars a week. That's how I used to calculate, right? Like I need to make my rent in a week. Mm. So how can I do that? And my boy was like, well, you can make $200 a day on a bicycle. I'm like, well, fuck that. Where, how? And I started being a messenger and I could make 400 a day on a bike. So that was a lucrative kind of thing with the caveat that I was a quote unquote independent contractor therefore i had no uh medical and really i had no rights as a employee they could cut me loose at any right. time or if you got injured that's it it's well that's and that's ultimately yeah. what happened and what happened next um i took a job at the post office right across the street from ps1 so this is 1987 1988 mm -hmm. i'm working at the post office across the street from ps1 that wonderful show back in 81 where even i was coming out you know as this cool young artist following the brake train all this like oh he's an abstract guy and he's kandinsky i didn't know who fucking kandinsky was but mm -hmm. i didn't care they were like referencing me to real art so i was just rolling with it but yet i have no opportunity i'm working at the post office here comes on esb save my ass in 88 Ricky Powell, rest in peace, another photographer from our culture. He passed some few years ago, the Rickster. Uh, he took a great photo of me after the opening of that show that Agnes brought work. Madonna, Sandra Bernhardt, uh, Jennifer Gray, me in a starter jacket, American baseball team, I love baseball, uh, the Orioles, and uh, some cool cycling glasses. Um, gets published in the Daily News. Artists opening, young, you know, celebrities, blah, blah, blah. Uh, next day, some employee at the post office is like, yo, Lenny, that's you, right? I'm like, no, that's not me. <laughs> you know, because I'm trying to like, you know, don't blow up my spot. And plus they're like, fucking postal workers and shit right i don't i don't know what's going on what the guy's gonna do so was i was before going that's postal. before going postal well, actually what happened was people went postal and they became a thing but postal employees stand back so i was i was basically blown up by the you know he's like yo so a couple of days later he comes back he's like because i you know deny deny right that's that's your first action deny and no not really um Cop to it if you fucked up, cop to it. But not that. I was like, no, 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 that's not me. 
And then he said, a couple of days later, he came back. He's like, yo, I seen you wear that jacket. He still had the, he still had the news. <laughs> I think he liked Madonna. He's like, yo, I seen you wear that jacket. And those glasses, you know, so I was like, all right, dude, you know, Miguel, whoever's Spanish kid. I was like, yo, just keep it on the low. Don't tell everybody. And then a few days later, I, I fucking left. So that was actually... It was a blessing, you know, that, that I had that moment and then, you know, the Agnes moment, really. And, uh, and back to Agnes, the beginning of the conversation, she kind of saved my ass, you know, or at least put me on a track where I didn't have to be working, you know, a kind of classic job. And, oh, yeah, I worked night shift at the post office. Okay, go ahead. Right. And so I remember her telling me about, you know, how she was working with you and helping you. And I remember she was saying that because you had just had your two children and then she loves children, so she's just like, I'm going to look out for Lenny because he's got these two beautiful kids. Yeah, by then I actually did let. have two kids, damn it, yeah. Right, and yeah. so she was. it was very important for her to look out for you. And obviously, you know, having children, it, it changes your life, you know, after I had my two kids, like, um, like shortly after I realized, you know, living in New York was not really the place I wanted to be if I wanted to raise them properly. And so, you know, artists are like all or nothing type people. In my mind, I'm like that, and I'm pretty sure you were like that too. So it must have been a very interesting time, like when you were going through the transition of like graffiti art, like not doing that anymore, and then raising your children, there's a lot of stress involved. But, you know, how did you cope during that time? It must have been difficult, but you had to... I mean, you, you know, know I, thing, I would obviously. never... Uh, you know project my difficulties on you know whatever i was dealing with at the time right because it's like well it's my burden but yeah there was rough and you know i was grateful when there were kind of moments of good times and stuff and you know wasn't as stressed but yeah truth be told i don't think i was actually financially ready you know i, I know i wasn't but it, that was maybe my only fault because I, I think i brought that uh you know, being a parent and caring for my children, obviously, you know, it's like my priority. And I, I said that, you know, uh, that's my best work. And it was a, a fantastic collaboration. They're incredible. You know? Yeah, both of Thank them. You. Amazing. Thank you. So talented. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. very happy, you know, obviously. And that's uh, also helps me, you know, um, where I'm at now, not having to deal with something like that. And like I said, I mean, we're lucky. I don't know. I guess the genetics are really good. We've all been very healthy. And I just, I pray, you know, that we can, uh, you know, just keep, keep it going. Definitely. Most definitely. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Do thank we have you time so for much. a couple questions from the yeah, audience? Anybody, Is that, would anybody you want to do that? Anybody brave enough to kick it? Would anybody like to ask uh, Len Leonard any questions? Anybody in the audience? Okay, hold on. Hi, Lenny. So uh, basically, Hi uh, you're in my inspiration for being a graffiti artist. 40 wow. years now. And, and, and uh, where are you from, sir? Uh, just outside London, but I live here now. And, okay. Uh, basically, uh, I'm big into hip hop, and that's how I got into graffiti, because sure. we got exported, 82, you know, that whole scene came over. Yes, yes. And basically... Are you into hip hop or are you into rock? <laughs> because they say the graffiti artists in the seventies were all into heavy metal, and I'm like, come on, you got to be into funk and soul as well. Well, I grew up on, you know, Motown. Uh, you know, my mom was really into, you know, the black sound. My mom was black. My so my name is McGurr, which is uh, my dad's. <laughs> my dad, my dad was actually not my biological dad. He's a wonderful guy. He's no longer here. Uh, Irish Catholic from Jersey and my mom was uh, a black lady from Chicago so I grew up uh, in the house with my mom my mom was like a housewife she never really left the house and I've grown up to realize like this interracial couple that raised me was quite unique in how they were going about their lives at that time you know it's very progressive I think for them to have done that but Love R&B, love Smokey, love anything coming out of Motown, for sure. The Supreme, you know, all that shit. And then, you know, whatever would come elsewhere and Smokey and, and all that stuff. But I did like rock, too. And I must admit, you know, the Beatles arrival, I was just a kid, but I thought that shit was pretty cool. And I, I love Led Zepp. I love Jimmy. I do love rock, you know, so I'm a rock guy. And I love all the early 80s, as corny as some of those lyrics were. I would have to say... Wu-Tang's my shit as far as 
if I'm gonna define, you know, a New York rap sound, I, I want to align myself with that moment in the '90s when they came to be. But now it's sort of all too commercial. Love Jay, love Jay. You know, like love everybody, I guess. But I'm, I'm not. I just not as into music anymore. That's the problem, really. Thank you, though. Uh, another, what did you write? Hang on. What did you write? Uh, well, my crew name was Mac. Mac. Oh, Mac. M A C H. Mac. So did the Brits say Mac? They do. Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I know. I mean, we say Mac, but I got it. Mac. <laughs> Mac. And what do you say? Aluminium. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Another question okay. from anybody who would like to ask. Okay. That's like a Vegemite thing, right? <laughs> Marmite. Yeah, well, well, one of them. Just keep so, the mites out. So, Lenny, I actually caught you on the Dithers series. Um, the Dithers? Yeah, it was like a series of videos. You're saying an interview, it was an interview video? Yep. Like in my studio, in yep. my one of my office spaces? Yeah. And uh, I'm like, you were showing rambling. Up. All your I'm uh, rambling in that. Yeah. Yeah. You were showing all of your collections. All my stuff. Remotes and yeah. all the stuff that you Oh yeah, I remember that. Rounds. All the remote control like Sony Plaza maybe, right? Yeah, is that yeah. what it was? Yeah. So I guess my question is, what are you into right now and what are your are you still collecting? Uh, nah, not really. I mean, uh, I unearthed my Star Wars collection recently, which I was kind of happy to get it all out of boxes and have a look at it cool, cool. uh back in the late 90s i had my own like in in this uh house we lived in i had a, a, like a room it was like my version of a japanese toy store uh, like super small but packed as fuck with like blister cards everywhere and it was really good i called it variant um, so i kind of recreated variant now in a little like star wars exclusive way it's really cool it's like in in my studio space but i'm into lego again i, I was into lego for many years i, I kind of jumped back into lego hoping uh to get picked up by the brand one day very cool, very cool. you were always i remember like uh at recon your store on eldridge um you were always you had a little window and you were always like in I the window. I had the GI Joe display. That's right. You're yeah. always setting up like yeah. little like dioramas with like soldiers yeah. like doing interesting stuff. And I was like, that's so cool. But I'm like, that's like he's like a big kid. Yeah, man. he's it's a, incredible. He's a I grown ass it. man. What is he doing? No, but yeah. I always thought that was really interesting because I, I was like, okay, well, you know, he's well. A lot of yeah, that was different. me reliving, or well, not reliving, but like living the life I never lived as a kid. You know, I never had Lego. I never had GI Joes. I never had shit. So when I got older and I had some loot, you know, I was throwing it at stuff like that rather than cars and fucking jewelry and, you know, watches and shit. Like, you know, I just move through stuff, time and space. I, I get inspired or excited by shit. I go way in too hard. And then I got to, you know, I do the moonwalk to get the hell out. But the one thing I can say about collecting, I learned uh, and I hated in the end. And I guess that's why I stopped. It's like you're not satisfied with what you have you're simply looking for what you don't mm. and there's no end there's there's no winning that game right? right so at the end of the day i was like no you know what like and there's so many criticisms could be drawn there you know all your uh materialism and you know oh my god and this and and hey back to sustainable look at all the waste in a way the packaging the this the that you know all that crap so it doesn't make you feel great and at that point like i say i just fell back and you know there's too many excesses obviously you know in all of it you know well, you gotta put it somewhere too <laughs> you do and storage adds up it's not as expensive as weed but it's costly <laughs> well it's it's it used to be more expensive back in the day it used to be for good stuff anyway well, right right not the shit i'm smoking <laughs> ah. <laughs> incredible is there anyone that wants to ask one well, more question no no there's not hey no all right Thank all right we've taken a lot of this man's time he's no, got no 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 know. but i'm 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 really excited guys back to the sculpture and why they got me out here yeah. i mean that's the biggest shit i've ever I've, I've, I've ever not did and because once again let's go back to all the uh, assembly people and and all my guys and gals whoever like i said put this together because it's remarkable there's got to be a hundred or so more what's what's beautiful about this piece unlike the figures that get sold and shit whatever the 
merchandising element of what I do, which has a certain form. This is a polygon form, which is quite wonderful. I love it. It's just all like, you know, it's 2001. It's, it's very futuristic and shit. So just to say all the work they did, I'm so grateful. And we're going to see it. And the shit is dope. I mean, it's fucking dope. I'm so proud of it. And, and like I say, I feel bad because I've been an artist that I touch everything I do. I, I do my own work, okay? I'm not, a, I'm not Jeff Koontz. I'm not someone like fucking third partying my labor for no that's what but you know what out here on this project it's the way it had to be right i mean like i guess if there wasn't covid i come out i could have come out and like picked up a bottle and like pushed a button but these guys did it all so let's remember that and thanks for the credit man i'll, I'll fucking take it it's like that 250 dollar oh no that was Two hundred fifty thousand dollar. It's like that other painting. Like I get the value of it, right? But what I wanted to find to you all, like I'm not here to say, "Yo, look at my shit." Let's recognize the people who did it, and I'm so grateful. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.